Stan Gibalisco here. I'd like to discuss just a little bit about the various layers of the Earth's ionosphere. The ionosphere, that is the upper atmosphere of the Earth, <clears throat> the lowest layer where all the weather occurs, is called the troposphere or troposphere. It extends up to about 10 miles or 16 kilometers above the surface, then the stratosphere extends up to approximately 30 miles or 50 kilometers above the surface. And then we get to the ionosphere. Now, ionosphere refers to the fact that the layers in various parts of this upper atmosphere become ionized, ionized atoms. What does that mean? It means that they acquire an electrical charge because, usually because, the electrons are stripped from the nuclei by radiation from the sun and also to some extent cosmic radiation from other parts of space, most notably the center of our galaxy. However, mainly it comes from the sun, <clears throat> and the sun is responsible, therefore, <clears throat> for the existence of these ionized layers. Now, why should we be interested in this? Well, from a standpoint of ham radio or amateur radio communications, the ionosphere is important at certain frequencies, particularly those frequencies below about 70 megahertz. Now, in fact, it's, the frequencies are usually well below even that. The most highly influenced bands, radio frequency bands, affected by the ionosphere and of interest to radio amateurs are referred to as the bands 160 through 10 meters. That refers to the wavelengths. 160 meters, approximately 1.8 megahertz to 2 megahertz. 80 meters, 3.5 to 4 megahertz. There is a 60 meter band around 5 megahertz, but I believe that's only a cha channel or two. And then we go on up. There is the 40 meter band from 7 to 7.3 megahertz. The 30 meter band from 10 point, it's a, I believe 10.1 to 10.2 megahertz thereabouts. The 20 meter band from 14 to 14.35 megahertz. The 17 meter band from 18.068 to 18.168 megahertz. The 15 meter band from 21 to 21.45 megahertz. The 12 meter band from 24.89 to 24.99 megahertz. And finally, the 10 meter band from 28 to 29.7 megahertz. A nice wide band, that one. Occasionally, we also see effects of the ionosphere at the 6 meter band from 50 to 54 megahertz, right around the old ch uh, channel 2 of analog television, if you remember that. Well, the E layer affects primarily uh, the uh, Earth's communications during the daylight hours uh, when the sun activity is particularly intense. You can get clouds of ionized atoms which reflect radio waves from the Earth. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. Radio waves, say, propagated from here. Actually, it refracts them. It bends them and returns them to the Earth at some distant, over-the-horizon point. 
we're uh, not showing the Earth's curvature here, but this uh, effect, and it can also occur at times repeatedly. Multiple hops, they call that. Multi-hop communications, if you get lucky. It'll bounce off the Earth, go back up again, take another hop, maybe even three hops, and so on and so on and so on. The D-layer rarely serves any useful purpose. In fact, it tends to impede propagation, radio wave communication on the so-called shortwave bands from 3 to 30 megahertz. It tends to absorb radio waves and exists primarily on the daylight side of the planet and is active especially below about 10 megahertz. So frequencies below about 10 megahertz do not propagate well through these upper layers during the daylight hours usually because this D layer keeps the radio waves from even getting to them. But the main layers, the layers of particular interest to us as radio hams are the F1 and the F2 layer. The F1 layer at a high altitude allows for long distance propagation with a single hop. And the F2 layer even longer distances with a single hop. And they tend to exist year round and day round depending upon the activity of the sun. Right now what you're hearing in the background by the way is 20 meter or 14 megahertz ham radio operators sending phase shift keyed signals. I have the radio tuned to a frequency of 14.070 megahertz and you are hearing signals from roughly this frequency up to 14.07 3 megahertz depending on the pitch of the audio that you hear if you've done phase shift keying you know all about that but the interesting thing about this it's about 6 p.m. local time mountain daylight time in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory these signals are propagating mainly by the F1 and F2 layers over distances up to several thousand kilometers I have heard signals already tonight from Argentina and from Cuba. Cuba is not all that far away. It's hardly farther than Florida, but Argentina is a good long distance. Now, I've been hearing that almost every evening, and that is almost certainly occurring because of the F1 and or F2 layers. So these are really the short wave radio listening layers the ones that make that old short wave remember that if you were old enough to remember short wave radio listening or short wave listening you'd hear these stations coming in and you still can you can still buy those kind of receivers at radio shack stores and other retail outlets they're not too common anymore but you can still find them most ham radio transceivers will cover these bands you can listen to distant countries some of them sending propaganda they still do that you know some of these countries still send their propaganda over shortwave radio remember radio free europe back in the days of the cold war in the 1950s and 1960s when the Russia then called the Soviet Union and the United States were not at all friendly with each other. In fact, they feared mutual destruction. Anyway, Europe was under the dominion, much of Europe, under the dominion of the Russians or the Soviets. And uh, they transmitted this shortwave radio signals called Radio Free Europe, which the Russians, of course, regarded as propaganda. But anyway... Uh, you can still hear some uh, countries sending stuff like that, if, but they're not always in English. But all of this stuff, all of these long-distance shortwave radio transmissions, which still fascinate me, occur because of these layers. And the interesting thing is that there is no...
no human-made infrastructure whatsoever. So if the internet went down, all of our power failed, all of our utilities failed, a ham radio operator with a battery-powered transceiver here in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, like me, I have a backup generator, I could run my nerd cave and communicate without any human-made infrastructure whatsoever with someone thousands and thousands of miles away with a similar installation, even if utility power were to fail all over the whole world. All the internet went down, all the electricity went down, but a couple of radio hams with backup generators or batteries and good antennas and could get on these short waves in these F1 and F2 layer ionized regions of our atmosphere would make it possible for them to communicate with each other. What would they say? <laughs> well, <coughs> that <coughs> might be the subject for some other video some other time. But Stan Jibalisco signing off once again from Dakota Territory near Deadwood in the Black Hills of South Dakota. If you're a ham radio operator, you know what 73 means. And everybody knows what so long means. Das Vidanya. Do you know what that means? <laughs> <laughs>